So our next speaker is Michael Hava. Uh, I, this year I have to practice my German a lot. M Michael is one of the representatives of the Austrian uh, national body in the C++ Standards Committee. We've met there uh, several times and he will be speaking about uh, concepts, which is one of my favorite things in C++ 20. So don't complain uh, too much about concepts in my presence. Okay, Michael. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So one thing out first, because it's always leading to confusion. The RISC is standing for Research in Symbolic Computing. It's the name of the institute we have been spun off more than 30 years ago. I'm not affiliated with the hardware business. <laughs> it's always coming up in an international context. Why are you called RISC? So we are talking about concepts and the talk is about C++ 20 concepts. And the ironic thing is we need to go back more than 30 years to actually talk about this stuff. Because if we look into design and evolution, there's a statement about the original design goals for templates. And the original design goals, there were three core things. You need templates to be fully expressive. So just because Bjarne couldn't figure out the, <coughs> an application for templates, that shouldn't mean you couldn't, you couldn't use that them. It should be zero overhead because otherwise nobody would use them. So the code that templates generate should be as efficient as if you've written the code per hand. And the third thing was good interfaces called constraints in the book. The idea was before templates, there was already an approach to do generic container stuff that was based on ugly macro-based stuff we don't want to talk about. And C++ improved type safety in interfaces for functions, etc., from the get-go. And we wanted to have the same stuff for generics. The problem was, back in the day, nobody could figure out how to get all of three of those. And now you have a classic design trade-off. You can get two of those, but you can't get three. So which one do you choose? You can't really get rid of full generalability because the allies madness this would mean templates are dead from the get-go. Same pretty much for zero overhead. We need zero overhead, otherwise people will, will be stuck with macros. Nobody wants people to be stuck with macros. So we need the first two. And the idea was we will not get good interfaces in the first version of templates. We will figure out a way to get them later. <laughs> Nobody would have guessed it's taking 30 plus years, but later. <laughs> so that led us to the templates we all know and love. We can write a generic function like men that takes two parameters of the same type. Internally, we have a less than operator and a ternary operator. And the interface is implicit with the usage inside the template. And if all goes well, everything's fine. So I can call this function min with two integers and it will generate a function min. That's as good as I've written it myself. If I do the same with doubles, same thing. Even for strings, because strings are orderable. What happens if I introduce something that's not less than comparable? Well, then the compiler will tell me in a nice readable way what's the actual issue. I think min and max are about the only function where it's a readable explanation what's the issue. So we'll come back to this issue later. Now we have to go to the other side of the world. In 1976, there was a Russian mathematician called Alex Stepanov that had a brilliant idea. Algorithms are defined on algebraic structures. That statement alone is the basis for what we got late 20, 
almost 20 years later in the SCL. What are algebraic structures? Well, it's a way to qualify what properties an operation has. I, I won't bore you with maths, but there's a hierarchy involved. We're starting with, to say an operation is a magma if the input parameter set and the output parameter set match. And if we add additional properties, these things have fancy names like Cini group if the operation is associative. And so on, if you have an identity, then we have a monoid. And inter, um, string addition is a classic example for a monoid. The idea is if we have an algorithm that's only expressed based on an algebraic structure, it will work for any algebraic structure that matches at least the structure we required for our interface. So what does this have to do with the SDL? Well, the SDL is essentially based on algebraic structures. We call them concepts. And the key concepts in the SDL are definitely the iterator concepts. Starting with the classic input iterator that allows us to traverse a range once and inspect the elements. Improving on that with a forward iterator to get multipass guarantees and essentially everything in the SDL is based on this concept. So I thought about how can I explain concepts in a short amount of time. And my conclusion was it's best to show them in action. And I've discovered, I've selected three prime examples of usage of concepts. The first one is we want to enforce type requirements going back to constraints. The second is we want to have optimized implementations. That's essentially why the STL works as well as it does. The third one are optional in operations. The important thing is all of these things are in the standard library since the beginning, since 1994 when the STL was merged. So concepts as a language feature is three years old. Concepts as a concept in the language is more than 30 years old. So let's start with the easiest example. We have a sort function that takes two iterators. And we have a nice comment that tells us it must at least be a random access iterator. Comments are nice because compilers can totally ignore them. <laughs> and uh, what we will see is if we have a list, then I think already people know there will be problems. Nice thing is, sort doesn't tell us there's a problem. But if we actually try to instantiate sort for a list iterators, we get a nice hint from the compiler that there's something off. <laughs> you know, I'm really happy that terminals are colored this. <laughs> 20 years ago, this would be a block of output and you had no idea what's going on. But if you actually look at the red part, there's a hint that there's a subtraction. And if you have programmed with the STL for 20 years, <laughs> you know that a subtraction is essentially a hint for just a random access iterators going on. And if you then look at the parameter tab somewhere, there is list iterator. And if you know a list is a linked list, you know there's a problem. So that's bad. Uh, we could actually improve on this before having concepts with something like a static assert in just emulating what the type checking could do. There's this helpful class iterator traits where we can put an iterator in and get the type of iterator it's modeling. And we can then check <laughs> if the type we are getting back is actually at least a random access iterator. And the nice thing is if we try that, then the error message actually tells us something because it tells us the iterator is not derived from, <coughs> the iterator category is not derived from the tag. So you still need to figure out what does this actually mean, but it's not like a kilometer of output anymore. Question is, can we improve on this with concepts? And let's start really easy. We'll keep this in the implementation and just say a require, it's a random access iterator. This will work. The uh, the static assert message changes only slightly, but 
that's way more readable, that's abstracting how do we actually determine how, what is in random access iterator. The problem is it's still in the implementation. We still have an untyped interface and then we are checking for, do we actually match the requirements? That's bad. So let's move this to the interface. So we can suffix a uh, template with, this is a requirement and come after the talk to me why this syntax is a thing. Because essentially it always reminds me of about Cunningham and Rich and Richie C. Has anyone ever seen how you do function declarations there? You state, I have these arguments, you don't specify a type, and then between the closing paren and the open braces, you can determine that thing is actually an integer, or that thing is a double. And this is kind of similar because we're still stating up front in I take any type, and later I say it actually has to be a random access iterator. But if you look at the error message, it already has changed. It's telling us there's no sort that we can call because this sort requires a random access iterator and a list iterator most certainly isn't one. But let's improve on this. We can actually move this before the function declaration. That's nice. So now I see upfront what the requirements, but even that syntax is kind of busy and is actually only needed if you have multiple requirements for one template parameter. Because if everything you do is require one concept to be matched for your type, you can actually simplify this to this. That's actually kind of nice. So you can state up front, I need a random access iterator. So let's look at another use case. We want optimized implementations. There's this classic function in the standard library. It's called distance. It computes the distance between two iterators. And as the comment already points out, if the iterator is at least a random access iterator, it's easy. We can subtract them and we get the distance in O1. In a forward iterator case or word, a bidirectional or an input iterator case, we can actually only traverse from first to last and count how many times did we have to implement this. How do we implement that? Well, we get our friend iterator traits and we get ourselves the tag. And then we need a second function. Here it's called distance impl. And we construct the default constructed instance of the iterator category. That's called tag dispatch. And the actual magic happens in the distance impl function, where we now actually have two functions overloaded based on the tag type. Notice the tag type instance is not even named. We don't need this thing. We just need to figure out which overload to actually call. And this relies on the fact that these tag types inherit from another. And in the language, there's a rule that if you have an overload set where there's inheritance involved, you will slice to the most derived you can. So if I have a contiguous iterator, that would actually fit both. And based on this rule, we will convert it into a random access iterator. Slicing here is no problem because there's no data involved. These Tag types have no content. So what will we do? If we have a random access iterator, we do the subtraction. In other cases, we have to count how many times can we increment the iterator. Can we improve on this with concepts? Sure. There's no need for an implementation function. We can just overload the two implementations based on concepts. The idea is the same, these concepts are in a hierarchy, not inheritance, but a hierarchy. Similar to the group OEs we saw a few slides back. And we have two overloads, one that takes a random access iterator, one that takes an input iterator. And the basic idea is the compiler will figure out which, uh, which of these concepts will our parameter match. 
if it matches both, it uses the more specific one. So if I have a vector iterator, that's both an input iterator and a random access iterator, so it's calling the implementation for random access iterator. <coughs> so now, the grand finale. How do we implement optional functions? And I've taken this out of the vector header, and we only need two constructors for this to, to happen. We have a template vector, and we have two constructors, one that takes a count, and an element that's to be replicated in the vector. The other one is, take, is a templated constructor that's taking two iterators. So the idea is we copy the elements from the range into the vector. As is expelled out by the requires comment, this thing should only be called for iterators. So looking at the call side, that has anyone an idea what happens here? Guesses. <laughs> the first overload. That would be nice. Let's see what happens. That's actually a compiler error. You, you won't enc uh, encounter this if you actually are using an STL because the actual implementation has this not as a comment but as an implementation detail. So what's happening here? We have two overloads. One is size t and an int. The other one determines that it must be an int and has two parameters of type int. That's two distinct constructors. And for one of them, we don't need to convert arguments. We can just pass along two integers. For the second one, we need to convert an integer to a size t. So obviously, this one is the constructor we want to call. <laughs> There's a workaround here that's quite ugly. We could just say users always need to specify that the first argument is a size t. <laughs> I think people would hate us even more if we'd require that one. <laughs> so how do we fix this? How can we prevent this constructor to be called? And this is relying on a nice little feature with the name Sphenae. So we need an additional template parameter. I don't think I will explain that one in detail. Um, that one is internally checking if we are getting an iterator. And if we instantiate this parameter for enable if with something that's not an iterator, then there's a certain kind of failure that per standard is sphenae, which stands for substitution failure is not an error. So you're trying to instantiate a template. You are encountering this specific kind of error. It's not any kind of error. It's a specific kind. And if that one happens, you're acting like there's no template. I never tried to instantiate the template, and this thing just vanishes for the compiler. And then there's only one overload, the one that takes a size t and an int. And we can fix, I call that one, because we can always go from an int to a size t. Well, with concepts, it's kind of unspectacular. We can just say, you know, this parent constructor needs an input iterator, and things will work. So, take questions right now. I, I would take questions if there are questions right now. I, I seem to remember, but maybe I'm wrong, that uh, uh, integers are like technical input iterators and you need to do some special provision in order not to be swallowed by the second overload or maybe I'm wrong about that. But no, integers can't be iterators, they're not dereferenceable. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. If, if I am not wrong, the example with size t can be simplified in the latest version by yeah, writing 10 most definitely. Z <laughs> with the suffix z. 
Sure. Well, well, then you need a using namespace literals. Or did we make that one? No, no, it is in the Oh, okay. Um, so you, you, you compare two solutions. Uh, maybe you have a, an opinion about the third one, which is if const expr. Well, if const expr is nice if you want to locally do an optimization. Uh, normally, I want these things to be in the interface. So I'd always prefer to have dedicated overloads. <laughs> uh, if we look at the example uh, where you where you have overload for uh, two different iterator types, you had to say that, okay, we will use one or the other one because one is more precise. If I write it in the same function with if const expert, I explicitly say that. Right, so if I say if random, do that. If not random, do something else. I don't have to rely on uh, assumptions or rely on how far uh, one type is uh, from the other one. Well, I, I would definitely prefer the one with the two overloads. Using const expert for uh, this kind of stuff is possible, but it's kind of ugly. Since we've had three options, what's your opinion on this fourth one? <laughs> um, you could, theoretically, if you want really, really fast compile time and you have a large overload set of constructors that are all Sphenating, you could have one public constructor that's very generic and then tag dispatches based on what it gets to different private delegating constructors. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna uh, discuss uh, compile time optimizations right now. <laughs> not fair but enough. Maybe in the evening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a date. <laughs> Any other thing? So, so I think you should kay. proceed. So let's see how do we actually define concepts. There are three things we need to consider. First one are so-called atomic constraints, which form the basis for our concept. Then actual requirements, which are the interesting stuff. And then we need to talk about some assumption. How can we actually say this concept specializes another concept? Let's start from the beginning. There is a good mental model if you're designing concepts and that is think about them as predicates to a type. That's not technically what's happening in the compiler, but that's a good mental model for designing this kind of stuff. And the atomic constraints are kind of easy. We just say we have a concept and that matches a Boolean expression. And a vast majority of those will be calls to a type trait because type traits <laughs> can't go away. Because there's one thing that can, you can't do with concepts that you can do with type traits, and that's specialization. So you can never specialize a concept. And if you want to do something akin to specialization, you actually need to introduce another type trait. That's something the ranges library is, for example, doing for borrower to ranges. So we see these things, things are pretty natural. We can just say, this Boolean expression is a concept. We can use those immediately and say, you know, I have three overloads. One takes an enum, one takes a class, one takes a primitive. And if we call this overloaded functions, it will call the correct overload. That's nice. <laughs> I have nothing to expand on that. That's, that's just nice. But that's kind of boring. So let's look at the really meaty stuff that was just constraints. We can add a requires statement. And a requires statement can take parameters. In this case, I'll take an instance of T. And I'll specify syntactic requirements for my type. And there are three main groups of requirements you can specify. One is a simple requirement stating this syntax must, must be valid. So I'm modeling a concept named maybe, and the idea is maybe models an optional kind of thing. Still optional, boost optional, 
your own optional. Maybe even something like a unique pointer. And all of these things hopefully are convertible to bool, because how would I otherwise check if there's actually a thing in there? So these things are kind of nice. Then the second kind is type requirements I can check. Is there a nested type? I can also check is there a dependent type if I instantiate another template. Example, if I want to implement something like input iterator concept, I need to check is that respective tag in there. And the third one is actually the kind of interesting thing. Compound requirements allow me to specify this syntax must be valid. I can actually say this thing must not only be valid, it may not throw an exception. And I can specify, you know, this thing must return something. And I can go out on a limp and say, when I dereference my optional thingy, it must have a common reference with the value type. The thing is, I can put a type here. I can only put a requirement there. So if I want to require an exact type, I would say same as, which is essentially is same V wrapped in a concept. Yeah, um, these things are really cool. If you think about it, these things act essentially like interfaces, but a compile time. Um, and now I can use this thing in overloading. And if I have two overloads, one that takes a primitive and one that takes a maybe, I can get these to call the right overload. But if I change this just a bit, and I have two overloads, one taking a class type and one taking a maybe, there are problems. Because for an optional, I can't decide which overload to call. Because an optional is a maybe. An optional is also a class, and now this thing is ambiguous. Now, how do I fix this? Well, I need some assumption where I can tell the compiler how to order these things if they are overloaded. That's kind of easy to do. I can use Boolean algebra to tell, you know, a maybe is a class and then the requirements we had before. There's a hidden gotcha here. If I would write is class v, then this thing breaks down. It won't work. Because the implementation of a concept and the concept itself are not the same thing and subsumption only happens between concepts. But with this little change, this is actually fine. Um, the same rules apply. You have an overloaded set, both concepts are matched. We are taking the more specific one, which is the one that has more input. And that's all I prepared. Questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the talk first. And yeah, the point of the concept, the concept is that uh, if you make an error in a template, it comes like 100 lines of error and it's very difficult to follow <laughs> that. Yeah. And that has been happening since, I don't know, C++ in templates, C++ 11, even before, like... It happens since we have templates. So, I think 89? I mean, it shouldn't be that something similar like that be almost uh, since when it started happening, because I still, in my, in my company, a lot of, we see, you make a small error with strings or something, a normal class, a template class, and you see like hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of error lines and it's a little bit demotivating. <laughs> yeah, sure, it's definitely demotivating to have something like this. <laughs> the, the thing is, uh, 
these things are, this con uh, talk is called C++ Trinity Concepts because there's actually a roadblock. There was an attempt to do concepts in the second C++ standard. So if you go with, by the literature, it's called C++ OX concepts or C++ 11 concepts and they were almost published and then there were issues. And Unfortunately, issue, resolving those issues took almost a decade. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of wrong. We had a TS in between, but uh, uh, it took years to figure out how to fix this. And if we are strictly honest, we have not fully implemented what was originally described as concepts by Stepanov. Because there's this thing called axioms where you actually specify semantic requirements we don't do that. So it turns out we don't need those as often as we'd think. Would be nice to have them, but now we have them without it. The feature was called Concepts Light for this reason, if you want to look into the literature. OK, thanks. <laughs> uh, concepts. 11 were in the draft standard for some time. We conceptified the whole uh, standard library and then at the very last moment, some issues were found and because there was a major uh, disagreement, we decided to rip off from the standard, which took a lot of effort to remove concepts of let's say 800 pages at, le at least uh, uh, of the standard. So this uh, second version, it, has, it hasn't everything, but uh, the design process was slightly uh, different. Instead of thinking what we could have in concepts, what uh, a small group did is try to find which were the concepts that you really had in the standard library and then decide what, what were the language mechanisms that we really need, uh, needed for that. And it happened that more or less with this, it was enough and that we can express the standard library with a small set of concepts. Um, I haven't followed concepts lately. Uh, I read about them probably around 2014, something like that. Um, one of the concerns I had at the time, and I don't know if it's been resolved, is that the subsumption rules that you stated um, basically have a, this concept requires that it fulfills that other concept and these additional clauses. Um, this means that a third party developer cannot introduce a concept that is somewhere in between. Uh, let's say that you have iterator and random access iterator, but for some reason I want a different flavor of iterator that is more than iterator and less than random access. I cannot really define um, something in between. Is this something that has been solved or something, for example, subsumption rules could be defined uh, based not only on the concept declared, but also on it fulfills some of the same requirements <coughs> that are expressed that could lead to a different assumption rule. I don't know if that's what's happening. Uh, <laughs> I think at the moment that's impossible. So, I have a suggestion. Write a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, that's uh, the, the issue. This is something that probably solves some uh, use cases. I feel not that much, and we need to balance between the effort of introducing additional complexities and the benefits uh, we get. Uh, one, this bar ha will have stronger opinions than me. The, the only other thing that I wanted to say is that another thing that we need to balance when we make these decisions is compilation times. You don't want to have this at any price in compilation times. 
you may want to pay some price, not the full price. I just want to respond to, to David. <laughs> because I think you can do it. You can basically have your new concept, which is in between, let's say, forward and random access iterator, be refinement of forward iterator, and not random access iterator, because you can have negations of concepts as well. You can have negations of requires. So you would not conflict with the other subsuming thing. But you don't insert the addition in the Yeah. But well, you do. He wants to insert in the middle. Uh, could be feasible in the sense that uh, it, it could be feasible in, uh, if I understood it correctly. You be, you're basically saying my new concept is iterator. So anything that fulfills this also fulfills iterator. But also my concept requires not random iterator. Okay. In which case, uh, anything that is a proper random iterator would be discarded. I don't know whether it will work, uh, but it looks like a promising idea. I mean, you, you'd have something that's an iterator. And well, the priority could be, let's say, between forward iterator and bidirectional iterator. Like if you go with this hierarchy to be more concrete, like let's say you have something between input iterator and forward iterator. Right, you, you are an input I mean, iterator, but not a forward iterator. I mean, maybe I understood the question. Okay. If you want to fog off, yeah, that's possible. If <laughs> you want to get back in here, that, that's the tricky one where I'm not sure you can actually do. So, fogging off is easy. Um, just a question. If you have a lattice like hierarchy of concepts, um, there are two uh, superior concepts that fulfill uh, the requirements. Which one is, uh, how, how does it work? I guess that the compiler just issues an error. Can you somehow say, I want to run this version or, or this other version? No, oh, if it's ambiguous, the compiler will always can generate an error. If by Boolean induction you can prove that one overload is the one that matches, it would call that one. Yes, but if there are two matching and there is no one which is greater than the other, they are, it's like a lattice like. Then it's undecidable. And you, can, you cannot choose? No. Okay. okay. More questions? Uh, then, because we have time, I, I will. At this in mind, oh, I am the last in the queue. Yeah, I'm not sure if you already answered this question, but how is it with the compile time yeah, impacts of using uh, concepts? Uh, I won't make a general statement that <laughs> about that one. It, it hasn't been a problem since we rolled out this uh, in our own software concepts. Uh, I won't dare to make an official statement about the overhead of concepts. And another question, because we had this talk about coroutines and now we have the concept. And coroutines, yeah, they kind of require stuff as well. Let's say you have this promise type in, inside of a coroutine and so on. Do you think um, that should also be used by concepts or rather should concepts be used to, to indicate those stuff, or how do you see that? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. And yeah, when you create uh, coroutines, then yeah, the coroutine that you have, you have to have a nested class inside of that, the promise type and the yeah. promise ties needs to have a specific interface and so on. Um, do you think that should also be kind of a concept or is that out of the realm of concepts? Uh, I mean, that would be nice, the thing is, you don't actually need to have a nested type for, for the, the coroutine wrapper in, in general. There's a theoretically a way to do that without that one. Um, I mean, hidden inside the compiler is something similar because as you've seen yesterday, all of a sudden the compiler starts complaining about you don't have a return void. <coughs> and 
actually it tells you you actually need a return void or return value. So that's kind of similar. It's it's not expressed as concepts in general. But, but that's the same how the the min was working before, right? The compiler tried to do the comparison, but in in concept it tries to call a function, and when it does it, it fails. Is my understanding? Yeah. But like like for for min, we don't want to have we don't want to have the compiler error when we try to do the. The lesson less or equal. Not well, less. no, this one should always generate a compiler also with concepts because up there should be uh, less than comparable. Right, and I agree with that. But I mean, for, for coroutines, the, the compiler errors that we saw yesterday was when the compiler tried to call the functions. But having a concept, I guess, would make that on a higher level. I mean, before it tried to, the compiler would try I mean, to call the function. There, there technically is a concept, it's embedded in a compiler. It's unfortunately not expressed in the library. It should actually be doable. Oh, but there's a whole lot of optional stuff in this coroutine promise type you can and do not need to provide. I, I am not sure if what uh, as a user you want is that the compiler tells you, hi, this is not a, a coroutine type. Or what you want is, hey, this is missing this member function. So that, that's also an issue that sometimes, uh, not always the higher level is the best. It depends on the, on the case. And maybe don't forget that the promise type of a coroutine is not actually something that should be end user facing. So actually only library writers should think about this promise type thing that's not something you actually ever want to spill out to your users. And library writers have to suffer, that's my life. Any other question? Um, why is it preferred to have overloading templates is, instead of the if context per that was mentioned before? I mean, Since it is explicit and more easy to read and you know what the compiler would do. No, uh, the thing is, uh, I prefer typed interfaces, but I guess Daniel has something to say about that one too. <laughs> and, and I see deep muscle. <laughs> I, I will start at the end. I voted against if concesper. <laughs> okay, that gives you an idea. I mean, now seriously, there are cases where if concesper is okay, but if I have the choice to express something between if concepts or concepts, at least myself, will use concepts. For the very same reason that I do not write a single function and then a lots of ifs when I can write an overload set. So for me, so, uh, somebody before said, did my always have opinions too, right? <laughs> uh, some, so, uh, uh, I was uh, I got distracted. Uh, uh, the the issue at the end is if concepts is a closed solution, yeah. using concepts is an open solution, and I and I think the, this has a strong value. There might be small cases where you want the closed solution, but the closed solution is not extensible at all. Every time that I want to extend, I have to go to a single function body and modify it. Sometimes that's okay. But uh, in my experience, many more times, you prefer, you prefer the open extensible solution. But uh, of course, this is something that is subjective. <laughs> so I, I agree that in principle, what you do with the if context were branches, True, that's a closed set. But as long as you put a concept on that function that constrains it to all the possibilities, you can still add another overload. So it's a mix of closed and open. You can still overload it. And um, personally, for me, if const expert is a lifesaver. <laughs> <It's, laughs> but yes, yes, sure. Um, the, there's another question in that area, and, and that is, Sometimes it's nicer for the user 
if you don't have the concept, uh, concept constraining what you can do with it, but a static assert inside. So uh, there is a design decision to be made here. Is, is it important that this substitution failure is not an error happens, or is it more helpful if it's actually getting instantiated and then the user gets a helpful error message? So we have <laughs> this design decision to do there, right? What concepts, what overload set, what do we do with if constant, or on what we do with static assert? And it's not obvious and there's no simple rules. It's got to do with experience and, and, and uh, finding out what is, what is the best experience of using this, right? So going back to the if concepts, um, ca can you show the slide 16, please? Because I think it's uh, uh, the, the previous one. Uh, so the, this, this is the function that the user is expecting to use, not the distance symp. So for me, the concept should go here. And then in the implementation, you should use if concepts press if can be, if it, that's doable. So what I mean is that distance should be using a concept only to match iterators, but then the implementation should not use concepts, should use if concepts break, because I, I think that's easier and more readable and, yep. I don't know if that's uh, It's extensible. <laughs> So, you know, distance is, it can be matches security. That it's an iterator, but then your implementation is that you can use something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now thinking on, on the interface, right? If you provide just a distance that can accept anything, a user will not know what is going on. But if you use concepts here, you can say, you can give a contract to the user, like saying, okay, if you give me a random access iterator, it will be faster. And the user will know that. So in order to give more information to the user, I think having concepts here is, is more helpful. That's an opinion also. For, for library design, I think it brings more to the table. But in, in spite of that, giving the lowest <laughs> iterator that you can act as an iterator, and then in the implementation, select the best iterator for the best performance function, yeah. would also better for the user because the user gives any iterator, don't, don't have to worry about any overloading, and then the function detail selects the best option. That, that has to happen. You, you can do the same thing if you have it in the interface, so there is no change for the user. I think, uh, uh, in simple words, is if you have access to the code of the function, uh, probably it's easier to use const export. If not, probably it's better to stick with uh, concept design. So if, for example, the implementation of this function is in STD, probably you don't want to change it. It's better to have uh, uh, your provided override in, in a STD namespace or something like that. Thank you. I do prefer my users to read interfaces than to read implementation. I don't want my users to have to read implementation. So I don't want my users to have to read if consesper. <laughs> and it's a very interesting discussion, but uh, we have our next talk. Uh, pl please, thank you very much.